In this tutorial, I'll build on the introduction to HVAC loops tutorial and discuss the key considerations when modelling hot water loops. During the tutorial, I'll review the edit dialogues for the loop and system components and then run a quick simulation and review the results. I'm going to model a relatively simple hot water loop serving radiators in this tutorial. Please view the previous Introduction to HVAC Loops tutorial if you need further information on how this system was created. As this system won't have any mechanical ventilation, I'll load the hot water radiator with NAPVENT. Template. And I'll set the natural ventilation to provide the minimum fresh air per person according to a schedule. So it will be modelled in the normal way outside the detailed HVAC system. The mechanical ventilation and cooling options are automatically disabled by this template. If I later decide to add these capabilities to my detailed HVAC system, I would have to enable them here to include them in any heating and cooling design calculations. I'll now review the edit dialogues for the system components, starting at the hot water loop level. After navigating to the required component, the edit dialogue for that component is accessible via the toolbar, the info panel or the right mouse button. The purpose of the hot water loop edit dialog is to enable you to modify the loop characteristics and sizing data and set up various equipment operation schemes for the loop. Many of the dialog inputs are self-explanatory and all are described in the help file so I'll only review those which are particularly important or where further explanation may be helpful. Starting here in the general tab Design Builder provides a name for the loop automatically, which you can change here. This will be the reference name in any simulation outputs. The plant loop volume determines the capacitance of the system, which ultimately affects the system response time to control actions. If you don't have data for the whole loop volume, the auto calculate option gives reasonable results for most system sizes. You can select whether the control strategy will be constant or variable flow, which will also fix that aspect of boiler and pump operation. You'll see this blue auto size input on many of the edit dialogues. If the auto size option is used, that element of the system will be automatically sized by Energy Plus in the HVAC auto sizing simulation and the calculated values used as inputs to the subsequent Energy Plus simulation. You can enter your own value if you have appropriate data. Consider initially leaving everything set to auto size when setting up the model. Once you've confirmed that the HVAC system runs correctly, you can then start to modify the sizing inputs and checking results systematically. The load distribution scheme is explained here in the info panel. The default option provides sequential control of multiple boilers and the details of how this operates are defined in the plant operation tab. The optimal control option can be used to provide more efficient control if the plant in your building has an optimal control strategy. The design loop exit temperature is the temperature at which the water is supplied to the hot water coils in the demand subloop and the temperature difference is the temperature reduction across the demand loop. Note that these values are used to size the loop and do not necessarily reflect the actual values calculated at each time step in the simulation. The availability schedule is set to on and determines whether the hot water loop is available during the simulation. 
This can be modified using the external cut in and cut out temperatures to prevent plant wasting energy by frequently cycling on and off at very low loads. The plant equipment operation tab can be used to set priorities and sequence plant and I'll cover this in the tutorial which deals with multiple plant systems. Going to the boiler dialog Design Builder will add an appropriate name which you can modify if required. You can select a different boiler template from the library which will auto populate the relevant fields below. The fuel type can be selected but the flow mode is fixed by the loop setting. Note that there are two auto sized values in this particular dialog. The design water flow rate is combined with the design water outlet temperature to meet the boiler's nominal or maximum rated capacity here. Where you have more than one auto sizable option for a component you should either use auto size or input manual data consistently. You shouldn't auto size one and manually size the other in this dialog for example. The parasitic electric load accounts for the energy consumed by the boiler controls and ancillaries. This power consumption adds nothing to the system temperature but is accounted for in the system's electricity consumption. The sizing factor is used in multi-boiler loops and allows the user to size an individual boiler to meet part of the design load in conjunction with the auto size option if that is used. It adjusts the nominal capacity and design water flow rate of that particular boiler. For example, if two boilers of equal capacity are to be used in the loop, the sizing factor may be set to 0.5 for each boiler. The nominal thermal efficiency is the manufacturer's efficiency at rated output conditions, i.e. when operating at 100% capacity and using the fuel's higher heating value, also called higher or gross calorific value. If the efficiency data you have is based on the lower or net calorific value, you must convert this and input the higher value. There's guidance on this in the help file. The nominal efficiency value entered will be used with the boiler efficiency curve and temperature data to determine the operating efficiency at each time step. A relevant boiler efficiency curve is loaded by the boiler template which will be sufficient for most modelling needs. Other curves are available. And you can create and load your own if required. The supply subloop includes a set point manager, enabling you to define a temperature set point and a schedule during which that temperature is used. The set point manager is set up by default to control the hot water flow temperature to a constant 80 degrees C. You can load a different compact schedule if desired. Note that this is a temperature set point schedule so the set point value is always in SI units, i.e. degrees C. You can also use the outdoor reset, outdoor air reset option to simulate the effect of varying the flow temperature set point between the defined upper and lower outdoor air temperatures if your building has weather compensation controls. The second reset rule allows you to schedule another rule for specific periods for example. The position of the arrow on the set point manager symbol shows that it's controlling the flow temperature in the supply subloop after the boiler and supply mixer just before the flow enters the demand subloop.
The pump control type is fixed at either constant or variable speed depending on the setting made at loop level. It's not currently possible to calculate system resistance in the simulation, so you'll need to input a suitable pump head using design data if you wish to simulate pump energy consumption more accurately. If the variable flow option is selected, the resistance will be modified according to system curves to determine the energy consumption at each time step. Unlike fan motors, a pump motor is normally located outside the fluid flow, so there is no heat transfer between the motor and the fluid, hence this default value of zero. The pump control type options are explained here in the info panel. I'll set my pump to intermittent to improve the system efficiency. Going to the zone group edit dialog, I should first check that all of the required zones are assigned to my system. As I've defined a system, the heating and cooling priorities tab becomes active, but I only have one system defined, so there is only one option. You will, of course, also need to check that the sizing data is correct in the individual zones. I haven't changed the radiator zone component details, so can check these in any zone knowing that they'll be the same in all zones. The radiator is modelled as a constant temperature variable flow component, so as the zone temperature reaches its set point, the radiator valve will reduce the flow of hot water from the loop to the radiator. The maximum water flow and rated capacity can be auto-sized, or you can input both values manually from design data. The rated average between inlet and outlet water temperature or mean water temperature and rated mass flow are provided from manufacturers literature as they can be used to establish the performance criteria of the component. The default values are reasonable for traditional systems with higher flow temperatures in the absence of actual data but not for condensing systems with lower flow temperatures. Again, the radiant fraction defaults are a reasonable starting point. Many people are surprised at just how low the radiant fraction is for a component called a radiator. The component is scheduled on by default, so it will always be available to meet a demand placed on it, providing it's receiving hot water from the loop. You can schedule the availability of any zone component, if you want to override the higher level schedules. For example, to switch off the heating in a particular zone at specific times or dates. If I've changed any of the values for the zone radiator component and, and want to apply them to any other zone, I can simply select the zones here in the target tab. Now that I've connected my loops and checked all my data inputs, I'll run a quick winter design week simulation and select only sub hourly outputs at 10 time steps per hour. I'll leave the temperature control set to air temperature as this is not a highly radiant system and there are no other highly radiant features in the building such as poor insulation or large expanses of glazing, except in the reception, which would need to be considered. I'll report on all periods and then run the simulation. At building level, the fuel consumption breakdown here shows the heating system operating in the early hours to maintain the setback temperature in the building and then peaking to reach the set point temperature just prior to occupation. All of the plant availability schedules are set to on by default 
So using the simple HVAC activity data, our system will operate whenever there's a demand, i.e. to meet the set point and setback conditions defined in the model data activity and HVAC tabs. Going to the single day view, and navigating to Monday shows that the heating fuel consumption peaks or flatlines for a short time just prior to occupancy. This is the kind of detail that may not be evident using less time steps. The flatline means that the plant is operating at full capacity which given the boiler efficiency of 89% would equate to the heat, uh, heat gain to the building of around 100 kilowatts. In the activity tab we have a heating set point of 22 degrees C for the occupied zones and 20 degrees C for the reception and circulation areas. Navigating now to the ground floor east office in the model not in the zone group and going back to a seven day view we can see that the heating set point is achieved during occupancy showing that the system has sufficient capacity with natural ventilation enabled and low outdoor air temperatures, the zone temperatures stay much lower than you saw in the previous Introduction to HVAC Loops tutorial. The only significant setback operation in this zone is at the weekend and on Monday morning, which would be expected at design conditions. The heat balance graph shows the cooling effect due to natural ventilation which has to be offset by the heating system to maintain the heating set point during occupancy. Note how the cooling profile is similar to the fresh air profile below. The total fresh air profile shows that there is a degree of control action to limit the natural ventilation rate. This is because the default nap vent cooling set point is 22 degrees C which is the same as the heating set point and when the zone temperature is below the nap vent cooling set point temperature it will switch off. With the heating system being controlled there will be small variations in the zone temperature around the set point which results in the instability you see here with nap vent frequently cycling on and off. If you wish to avoid temperature control of natural ventilation you should change the nap vent cooling set point to zero. Nap vent will then always be provided according to the schedule and the extra heating load will be reflected in your heating energy consumption results. Going to the reception zone you can see that although the air temperature is controlled to the 20 degree C set point it takes a long time for the operative temperature to get anywhere near acceptable comfort levels. If we'd used operative control, the increased heat input at the start of the day would result in zone air temperatures of around 27 degrees C to offset the low radiant temperatures of the glazing. Other consequences of this would be increased plant sizes and higher energy consumption. In this tutorial I've reviewed the edit dialogues for a hot water loop with radiators providing some supplementary information which we hope you'll find useful. The winter design week simulation produced some interesting talking points not least some of the issues associated with the air and operative temperature control options.